Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 17th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. So we've got a couple new developments to talk about with respect to the CVE 2020-0601 vulnerability. That's the crypto API vulnerability. Has also sort of become known now as either let's decrypt or curveball. Well, uh, we do have actually now some tests available for you. A website curveballtest.com that you can use to check if your browser is vulnerable on that website. You you will also find a download for a simple binary that's signed with an invalid certificate so you can see if that gets noticed. Now, while we're experimenting with this, one thing we noticed is that browsers and various endpoint protection software really is sort of now detecting some of these invalid certificates. For example, Chrome just released an update that will block any invalid sites, even though Chrome itself on Windows 10 is vulnerable. It uses the crypto API but they added some additional checks to the browser itself to block it. Also, Firefox, of course, never really was vulnerable. And the Windows Defender also notes, for example, binaries with the bad signatures. All of these endpoint protection parts are a little bit hit and miss, depending on whether or not your signatures are all up to date. So even if you didn't patch, which still you should, it's still highly recommended that you patched, these other protection mechanisms will at least soften the impact of any exploit being directed at you. And we got a smaller but significant update for the Citrix ADC vulnerability. It turns out that the workaround actually doesn't work on certain builds of version 12.1 of the appliance. Now, if you're running one of these affected versions, uh, you should, according to the Dutch Cyber Security Centrum, just uh, turn off the device and wait for a patch to be released. This advice actually makes more sense uh, than it sounds. Uh, we do still see a continuous stream of exploit attempts hitting our honeypots, so you can't really just hide from uh, this vulnerability. And unless you can add some other mitigating controls like additional web application firewalls or such, yes, uh, turning off the device may be your best option. And with everything else uh, going on these last couple of weeks, there are a couple of stories that I didn't cover. So I want to catch up here on one story and that's Cable Haunt. It even got a logo, it got a catchy name and a website. The reason I haven't covered it so far is there isn't really that much you can do about this vulnerability. It's actually sort of two vulnerabilities that are part of this exploit. First one is cross-site request forging. So you would visit a website, the website would load JavaScript into your browser, and then an attacker would use that JavaScript to send requests to your cable modem. So the requests come from inside your network, which of course means that if you blocked access to things like the admin interface from outside your network, that would not block this attack. Also, the target of the request is actually not the web admin interface, but another service that's listening, that's used to manage the modem. So changing admin passwords in the web admin interface may actually also not make a difference. I still recommend you do this. These cross-site request forging vulnerabilities are somewhat common and having a strong admin password will at least block some of them. So what can you do? Well, on the website that I mentioned, uh, you can check if your modem is affected or not. Apparently hundreds of millions of modems are affected uh, by this. And then there isn't really much you can do because even if you own the modem, the firmware is typically managed by your ISP and it's up to the ISP to provide patches. And well, if you're using WordPress, uh, hey, imagine that there are more authentication bypass vulnerabilities for you to patch, or maybe just take the Dutch advice for Citrix and turn it off.
And well, it's a Friday, so we have a special interview here again today, and uh, we are back to STI students after doing things a little bit different over the holiday break. Today, I have John Michael here with me. So why don't you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for having me today, Johannes. Uh, this is uh, John Michael Lasik. I've been in the uh, IT industry for a little over 15 years now, and I currently work at a privately held retail company. Um, and I'm also in and kind of getting close to entering my uh, final year here at SANS in the master's program. So that's great. And your paper was about that entire you know, DevOps and how security fits in with that. That's, of course, a hot topic and a lot of organizations move into that direction. Could you describe a little bit what the paper was about, please? Yeah, so it's the title is uh, changing the DevOps culture one security scan at a time, and uh, I kind of came about the paper because of a, a role that I just moved into within my organization, and I started learning a little bit more about DevOps, and tried to pull on some of the experiences that I had from my previous days as a security analyst, and try to figure out how to merge the two together, and in particular with application scanning as applications were moving from a certification environment into production and kind of some of the pain points around that. Uh, and I found that it wasn't as common of a practice that I had thought it would be. And uh, some of the main reasons for that were due to just the the time that people thought that it would delay a, a pipeline release or some of the tools that were out there weren't quite capable of doing what traditional application scanners um, were performing in our in our traditional means of, of moving to production. So uh, that, that's that's how I got started with it, and um, I've kind of grown from there. And there's a there's a lot of benefits once you start integrating this practice into your DevOps culture. So DevOps really means that you have a very sort of rapid release cycle. So developers and the management are often concerned about security slowing things down. Uh, how are you able to kind of minimize the disruption that sort of security causes here? Well, yeah, and that's that's kind of one of the main reasons I jumped into this was that uh, in your traditional means, you, you kind of you scan that application once when you go in live, but any any major releases after that uh, rarely, if ever, get scanned after that. So, how can you, as a security professional, ensure that your your developers are pushing code into production that have uh, no vulnerabilities introduced to it and and tying into these pipeline extensions is, is the way to go. And it's a little bit foreign to security analysts because they're not in the DevOps culture day in and day out. And it's foreign to the developers because they're not in the security culture day in and day out. So how, merging these two two cultures together, uh, it, it, it I can see where the fear is, but once you get it going, it's it's extremely beneficial. One thing I saw, I think it was last week, uh, Vericode came out with sort of their software security uh, survey they regularly do. And uh, one of the things they pointed out was that uh, organizations that do regular security scans of software actually are better at fixing those vulnerabilities. And I've you know, heard a lot from pen testers and such that come to organizations and sort of find the same vulnerabilities they found last time they did a pen test. Do you think uh, it's really related that how often you scan, how better you are at fixing it? Or do you think really that organizations that worry about security, that fix vulnerabilities, they're the ones that also bother to uh, to scan on a regular basis? So kind of what's the cause and effect here? Any uh, hints from the work you have done? Oh, yeah, definitely. And that, and that leads to the culture change um, from the developer standpoint. So when you're when you're talking about CICD and the continual feedback loops, it, by integrating the security tools into that, you can you can automate that as well. So say for instance developers check their code in at night, they go home for the night and our security tools or the pipelines execute and they they come in in the morning and there's already bugs or work items in their backlog that are reflective of the code changes they made from the day before. So they know immediately because they have just coded that the day before. So it's fresh in their mind. They know the functions that they've just produced and the vulnerabilities that they introduced to that. So over time, as they they see these and they learn how to code more efficiently or uh, not necessarily efficiently, but more securely, 
they'll have less and less of this. And that just, that just turns the developer into a secure coder, um, leading to more efficient development and less vulnerabilities in the code that they're pushing to production. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Now, when you're running these uh, daily, I guess, you know, uh, scans in your case, uh, are these usually sort of static source code analysis like you typically do during development? Or do you also do some sort of runtime analysis uh, on the code? Yeah, so the research that I did had had a both a build one to analyze the static code. Uh, and I was using a tool called, called SonarCube. Uh, but then also in the release pipeline, we, we integrated uh, Zap as well. So uh, once the code was published to a certification environment, you could have Zap automatically go perform an autom- um, a vulnerability assessment of that. Uh, and then you could put some quality gates in in uh, place so that if you were to fail a, or introduce some vulnerabilities, it would no longer get pushed to production. But uh, there are plenty of tools out there for both static and dynamic code analysis. I've seen some organizations that sort of give access to the static code analysis tools to developers so they can run tests uh, whenever they would kind of like to. Is this something that you tried as well, or is it just as part of the uh, pipeline that the code is being tested? And the important thing to note here, too, is that point is these tools aren't necessarily just security extensions that are built into these pipelines. There are a number of bonuses that SonarCube specifically has. So the SonarCube tool itself has different analysis that isn't just related to, to vulnerabilities and bugs. It also talks about code read use, and that helps make the code a little bit more efficient and cleaner for developers. So again, over time, these these tools will help developers be a little bit more efficient with the way that they're coding things and the quality of the code that they're producing. Now, one of the criticisms, of course, with uh, tools that do sort of source code analysis is that uh, you often end up with a lot of false positives. Uh, How do you deal with that in the pipeline? Like, do you expect a piece of software to be bug-free when it comes out of the tool and you're going to reject it if it's not? Or uh, do you have some kind of uh, setup where certain bugs are allowed uh, because you assume they're commonly false positives. Right, yeah, with uh, each application that you're looking at individually, you'll have uh, different thresholds for your willingness to tolerate some of the the bugs that are being identified. To your point about um, false positives, these tools often offer the extensions or the exception-based type stuff that you're allowed to configure within them so that you know that this is the the vulnerability ABC that's being displayed on your screen is not a true vulnerability. So yes, you can you can whitelist that so that it does not um, stop your pipeline from continuing its deployment. And do you allow developers to actually configure this, or is this something where they, uh, if they f- think they found a false positive, they sort of have to talk to someone in security team or so to uh, approve that exception? Yeah, I think that that's all dependent upon the the culture that you have in your organization. Uh, I think as your coders become more security conscious and and have that confidence level, or in your security analysts have the confidence level in them that they're producing quality code and secure code, I think that will shift over time. But uh, when you're starting something out like this, it's it's definitely a collaboration between the two teams. So, but certainly a great learning experience, it sounds like, for developers as well uh, to implement these tools. Exactly. And that, and that goes to the, the change in the shift in culture as, as this process matures. Okay, good. So what's next for you? You said you have about a year left in the program? Yep. It's, uh, I have uh, just wrapped up the SANS 525 project management course, and I think I'm starting the 566 implementing and auditing critical control shortly and uh, in the springtime I'll be doing another research paper I still don't have the topic at hand right now but uh, looking forward to that this has been a great experience here at SANS Okay, thanks for joining me here and thanks everybody to, uh, who is listening here and talk to you again on Monday, bye